privilege and an honor to introduce Saida, Saida Hamid, who's a well-known social, social and women's rights activist. Actually, she's many, she has many parts. She's a very versatile and well-known woman. She has been an educationalist. She's a writer and she has also contributed towards making policy in the government as a member of the National Women's Commission and also as a member of the Planning Commission. She served as the Chancellor of the Walana Azad Urdu University in Hyderabad. For several decades now, she's been researching and writing on Azad Saab, Sufism, women's rights, and several other issues. She's a recipient of the Padma Shri. Now, this is a technical introduction of Saida, but I'd like to add that she is a remarkable woman. She's a woman not only of many parts, but of extraordinary courage and valor. She has been with every struggle that democratic movements have had. She's been a strong supporter, especially of women's rights and women's movement. She's been in the forefront of all civil rights issues, no matter whether it is uh, a question of fighting for equal rights, it's a question of fighting for justice, fighting for a greater voice in policy and, and legislation. She has been, along with me and many others, one of the fundamental principal strugglers, I would like to call her that, for all these basic rights. It's a great pleasure to welcome her today and to ask her to speak on Malana Abdul Kalam Azad. She has done research on him. He is a remarkable figure likewise. And he has been in my life a remarkable figure because he's been there when I was young. I've heard him, I've seen him. And it is for me not a part of history. It's a part of my living memory. And I welcome Saida Hamid and I hand it over to her now to talk to you. Um, thank you, um, Aruna. Uh, coming from you, it's, uh, you know, this introduction is very generous and I'm sure that a part of it is your love for me, which makes you say these things. But I, I'm equally beholden to you as the country is for what you are standing for and what the School for Democracy is standing for. And the fact that the School for Democracy uh, decided that it, they will have a session on Molana Abul Kalam Azad uh, in both languages. I think this is something which is uh, the need of the hour uh, because we, uh, you know, the whole world is convulsed in so many different ways, but the biggest convulsion that has been going on uh, since 9-11 has been Islam and terrorism. And if there is one answer, there is one uh, solution, there is one compassionate understanding of what Islam is all about. It's in, uh, in the works and the, and the writings and the speeches of Maulana Azad. So I will try in this next uh, while that has been given to me, I will try to give a, a, my view of, uh, you know, how, I mean, what I have studied and what I have understood. But let me begin uh, as Aruna did very personal, on a very personal note. Uh, she is younger than me, but she also recalls, because Mol uh, seeing Maulana, Maulana passed away in 1957. And I uh, recall um, visiting Maulana Azad uh, during Eid, because my father was his education secretary. And a great, um, I mean, in a sense, he was also his amanuensis. Uh, Maulana was very conversant in Urdu, English, Farsi, Arabic, and French. But he never, never spoke or wrote in English. Maybe he thought he couldn't, you know, he didn't have the perfect, and he was a perfectionist. So that was why Mola, uh, my father was his uh, amanuensis in, in uh, Urdu and English, and Humayu Kabir uh, was his amanuensis in English. So uh, I, I just want to, so I used to visit him, and even as a little girl, I used to find him so impressive as he used to be reclining on the sofa with a, uh, with a cigarette. He was a, quite a chain smoker and a, and a tea drinker. And I have those images in my mind. And then of course, the, the, uh, then what happened many, many years later, when I started working on, on Azad, then I thought that, um, you know, how, how can I, uh, how can I understand and even uh, begin to fathom the, the, uh, the depth of his scholarship. And believe me, there is so much. 
So I started um, reading through uh, huge uh, journals of his earliest publication, Al Hilal. And, uh, uh, and it was all in Urdu and it was all in those big folio editions. And so I went on and on doing it. And in 1988, because he was born in 1888, so 1988, India celebrated his centenary year. Now it's up to uh, School for Democracy to celebrate these things because this India doesn't celebrate Maulana Azad. So uh, that, it, to commemorate that, uh, to commemorate rate that year, I, I was asked to do four volumes on Maulana Azad. And uh, there were two volumes in English and one in Hindi and one in Urdu. And then, uh, so the, those became kind of a seminal, seminal work on Maulana Azad. The only thing which was done earlier was by um, uh, an Eng English man by the name of Ian Henderson Douglas. And then there was, uh, uh, then after that, nothing. And then these four uh, volumes came on the scene. And then those were more or less, um, uh, you know, um, a, a, um, a selection of his writings, which all I had to, I translated. Uh, and then there was um, his own uh, tributes and appraisals from everybody, all the scholars, politicians, everyone for centenary year, and the same in Urdu and the same in Hindi. Then I wrote my book, which uh, I am just going to refer to it off and on. It was called Maulana Azad Islam in the Indian National Movement. So this book was published by Oxford. And this was my, uh, my work on Maulana Azad, my understanding of Maulana Azad. So this by way of background, uh, I wanted to just share that with you. So let us, let us now look at this, look at Maulana Azad as a, as a person. And let's just go down this whole uh, the, uh, pages and pages of history. Okay. Um, he was born in Makkah. He was born in Makkah, where his father, Maulana Khairuddin, who was originally from Calcutta and who was, uh, who was a, a, a big uh, a Sufi peer in Calcutta, he, and his family was there too, he was sent to Makkah for further education. And there he married um, Alia, Alia Begum, who was the daughter of the uh, Harman, that is the, um, the chief of, of, of that that particular congregation. And so he was, he and his siblings were all born in Makkah. And he came to, um, then the, his father decided to return to India and return to Calcutta because Calcutta was, you know, that was their, their home, their place. And so he returned to Calcutta and uh, there he, um, his Piri Muridi tradition started. At that time, uh, Maulana Azad was about, I would say, seven or eight years old. So from then on became, began this phase of his, his phase in West Bengal and, and his whole identification with Bengal, his, his, um, his uh, love for that soil and his rise to uh, his stature on the soil of Calcutta. So that no, too many people don't associate uh, Calcutta with him. So I wanted to uh, emphasize that. So when he, and when he had reached there, he, um, uh, he did all his customary schooling and his finishing the Quran, his learning uh, even more uh, um, with greater rigor, his Arabic, his Farsi, his, but uh, let me say two things. One, that uh, he, his father never sent him to any school. So there is one myth that he went to, um, he went to um, Al-Azhar in Cairo, which is absolutely not right. He, he, his father did not believe that there was any school which could have given him the kind of rigorous training he could have given him. But that rigorous training meant that no Urdu, no English. Urdu also was a kind of a mixed language, so pure. You know, and his uh, the uh, spoken language in their house was Arabic. So from there, you know, when you think you when you when we talk about his speeches and all, so he was he used to um, uh, the, the the story is that at night he used to um, uh, he used to uh, he used to quietly read Urdu texts because he was very interested in 
Sir Sayyid Ahmad Khan's tehzeeb e akhlaq Later on, his philosophy was be would become very different from Sir Sayyid Ahmad Khan. So he started reading that, and, and he, very early, he began to, there were two things that happened to him. One was that he slowly did not like the Spiri Muridi tradition that he was, he could have easily inherited the mantle of his father. He could have thousands of murids, but all of this um, obsequiousness, he did not like. So he would also revolt from that. And, and the other thing was this reformist zeal in him. See, he was well-versed in the Quran. There was no question of that. He understood it, but he saw the kind of reform, the kind of degeneration that people, uh, his people of uh, the Muslims, the de degeneration of the Muslim qom. And from time to time, reformists have arisen and they have, um, you know, they have, um, they have held a mirror up to the society. So he decided very early in the game, and I'm, I'm just quoting these few lines from my book, and that will give you this, um, the sense. Young Azad, disenchanted with many practices, this is my book, uh, Malana Azad Islam in the Indian National Movement. Young Azad, disenchanted with many practices of Indian Muslims in the name of religion, appeared on the political scene in 1903. So he was 12, 15, 13 years old as a social and religious reformer. His first articles were about religious reform and social advancement. He was attempting to create in his fellow Muslims a heightened sense of political awareness and a recognition of their unified struggle in the peep of the in, in the in the he was importance of the unified struggle in the struggle of the peoples of Islamic countries against imperialism. So very early he was, you know, this imperialism was something that he was going to fight against. Indian leaders had not yet taken up the cause of complete independence. Gandhi was still in South Africa and barring a few important leaders and uh, of of Bengal, they were thinking only in terms of dominion status under the benign patronage of the British Quran. So that at that age of 15, he took out his first journal, which was called Lisanu Sidq, which means an Arabic word, which means the voice of truth. And at that a young age, he started lambasting the poem for their retrograde customs, for dowry, for violence, for um, you know, frowning upon widow remarriage. You know, Islam is absolutely not nothing against widow remarriage and and all of that. So he started and 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 a useless expenditure on flamboyant things. At that age, he started. But the real um, when he really broke into the uh, first glimmerings of the freedom movement was when he launched his first journal, which was called Al Hilal. Now, the word Hilal means the crescent. So this journal was Al-Hilal. It was in Urdu, and it hit the streets of Calcutta. He was at that, that was the year 1912. So he was um, all of 24. And this journal was the most uh, vociferous voice of um, two things. One was, you know, the, ref uh, the, reform, the reformist streak continued. But in the light of the Quran, he was going to tell his qom that there was no option, but it was the Islamic injunction for them to struggle against this, uh, struggle against the British and gain independence. Azadi, Hurriyat. Hurriyat means simply Azadi. So his struggle for Hurriyat started at that time in 1912 with the launching of Al-Hilal. And suddenly, you know, people in the streets of Calcutta, the Urdu knowing, they were astounded that this, you know, this young man has, and the Al-Hilal sold huge numbers of copies. And the other uh, issue, uh, the other sort of the principle, which he stuck with all his life, was that it is the duty of Muslims to join hands with the Hindus and together struggle for freedom. This has to be a unified front. And this principle, he did not deviate till the end. And let me just backtrack and say that a, a couple of years earlier, he had joined in Bengal. There was an underground movement called Jugantar. 
and Anushilan. So quietly he had joined this Jugantar and Anushilan. And the name that I remember now from my own research was Sham Sundar Chakravarti. So joining hands with this was one aspect. And the other aspect was, um, you know, propagating his, his, um, his ideas through, uh, through his um, Al-Hilal. In that, there, was, there is a very, very famous article which is called Al-Jihad Fi Sabil al Hurriyat, which means Jihad for the sake of Hurriyat, mean freedom. And the word Jihad is so badly understood and so convoluted, it simply means a struggle. And the biggest Jihad is one struggle against oneself. So anyway, so he, in, in, in this, uh, in Al-Hilal, he said something which I think is very important, and that is um, that uh, indeed through the Quran, uh, Muhammad had revealed, who, uh, the Quran had revealed that Muhammad, peace be upon him, was the last of his messengers, and there would be none after him. Therefore, the right of a Muslim to interpret for himself is also reinforced in all messages of Quran. So Quran, he said, he did a way with all the middle middle men and all the interpreters and all the gatekeepers and said that since the Quran says that Allah is closer to you than your jugular vein then you have to interpret and understand it on yourself and there he spoke about you know the importance of the whole Hurriyat idea and freedom and so he began to like you know in, in Hindi we say kante ki tarah khatakne laga he started, now the British started watching him with a lot of suspicion and they realized that this, this young man was really, you know, uh, creating all kinds of uh, uh, unwanted revolutions. He was a sedition. All the words that we use today, all of that was used, used for him. And so they pounced on him and they, um, they uh, confiscated the press and, and they, 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 they tore up everything, they destroyed everything. And within a very short while, he launched Al-Hilal in another, uh, he called it Al-Balag. And Al-Balag means, um, means the articulate. So Al-Balag was launched in another format, but the British would not, I mean, that, would, that was not, they, they would not be fooled by any such, uh, you know, a, um, manner of his trying to, uh, push his message and so therefore they decided that it's very dangerous for him to stay in Calcutta. He is corrupting, he is uh, uh, revolutionizing, so he, they decided to send him as a prisoner in a, um, a home confinement to Ranchi. He went away to Ranchi and there he stayed for four years. And what he did in Rachi was something which is spectacular. And that is there he completed his translation and his commentary on Quran. And I can say that as a very modest and humble scholar of the Quran, this is the world's most important commentary on the Quran because it shows Islam as a religion which encompasses and embraces the entire religions of the world. God is not the God of um, uh, Muslims, but he's the Rabbul Alameen. And, 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 uh, and Azad uh, very categorically says that he is the Rabb of the, of the Alam, which, is, which means he's the Rabbul Alameen, not the Rabbul Muslimin. So that explication and understanding of the Quran was something which, um, uh, which the world at that time they, you know, people understood and people appreciated, but it shook the orthodox. It completely, you know, it, it, their, uh, their um, hegemony on Islam, that was all rocked by this Tarjuman of Quran. But let me tell you um, another thing which would be of interest to you, that um, dedication, uh, uh, two things. One is dedication of Tarjuman of Quran. So uh, people dedicate such an important document. And I saw this actually, in, I actually saw this in his own handwriting, because my research was done at Indian Council for Cultural Rela Relations, Azad Library, where, um, uh, which, where Azad had donated 8,000 of his most precious books. And now that library does not exist, those manuscripts did not, do not exist. 
that is where existed the manuscripts of Mahabharat and Ramayan, which Azad, as an education minister, commissioned for translation into Arabic and Persian. So that was the extent of his commitment. And those manuscripts were also there. The, his own handwritten Tarjuman quran was also there. And none of it exists now. It's all gone. So I saw that myself. And the dedication of this was, and i just tell you one little anecdote and then go on ahead. So he wrote in the, in the, in the dedication that I was once going back to my um, confinement in, in Ranchi when I, someone was walking behind me. And I looked back and it was a man, uh, an old man who uh, looked like a Pathan. So I said, why, uh, what brings you here? He says, I have heard that you are the most learned and the most profound scholar of the Quran. And I want, I came here all the way from Kabul. I, I walked, I took, um, you know, my, my um, I, I took my, uh, caravans and, and people who were riding, I took, took, uh, completed the journey with them. And I, with great difficulty, I have reached. So as I've said, I sat him down and we had few sessions. And one morning I got up and the man was gone. And I, he was a very poor man. And I think he quietly left because he thought if he stayed on, um, I would try to give him some money to, um, uh, for his journey. And he said, I don't know his name. I don't know where he came from. I don't know his address. But had I, if, if I would have known it or not known it, I dedicate my Tarjuman al Quran to him. So this, was, um, this is typically Azad. And uh, I, I find that this needs, needs to be shared with uh, people who have this passion and understanding. So, any, so after that, he was, of course, um, the, the next phase is very important. Why is it so important? Because of the kind of the, the conditions in which we are living. And that is when he was uh, sent back to Calcutta. Once again, um, he was, uh, uh, once again, he was uh, uh, imprisoned again because he did not stop his revolutionary activities. And he was sent, he was going to be sent to the Alipur jail. Now, this is where he made a statement and the statement was called Kale Faisal. Kale Faisal means the last statement, the last judgment. And in that Kale Faisal, he, um, and that, you know, in a sense, reminds me of the Kale Faisal that we have been talking about for the last one and a half month, for obviously for the most important reasons in our, in our, own, in our own life and our own, uh, the textures in which we, have, we are existing. So this Kale Faisal is a long statement he made in front of the magistrate before he was sentenced for imprisonment at the Alipur jail. And what did he say? He said, uh, I was only 18 years old when I start, first started speaking and writing on the theme of freedom. I have consigned my entire existence to it and I have sacrificed the best years of my life that is whole of my youth to my love for this ideal. For four years, I've suffered in internment, but even during internment, I've never desisted from pursuing my goal and inviting people to adopt this uh, national ideal. And then he goes on and says, I have been charged with sedition, but let me understand the meaning of sedition. Can sedition be defined in terms of that struggle for freedom, which has not been successful? If so, I plead guilty. But at the same time, let me state this very thing. This very thing when successful is called patriotism. The insurgent leaders of Ireland were regarded as rebels till yesterday. But what title would Great Britain suggest for De Valera and Griffith today? And then he concludes, Mr. Magistrate, I will not take any more time of the court now. It is an interesting and instructive chapter of this history, which both of us are engaged in writing. The dock has fallen to our lot and to yours, the magisterial chair. I admit that this chair is as necessary for this work as this dock. Come, let us finish our role in this memorable drama. The historian is eagerly waiting 
and the future is looking forward to us. Allow us to occupy this dock repeatedly and continuously. And you may also go on writing the judgment again and again. For some more time, this work will continue until the gates of another court are flung open. That will be the court of the law of God. And time will act as its judge and pass the judgment. And that verdict will be final in all respects. I, there is so much, you know, in Kali Faisal that one, which resonates with what, you know, we are, what we are passing through in our life these days. And I, 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 we, we can talk more about it, but let me just go on. Um, now, this is, this, all of this is happening just before he get, got, gets on to the national scene. And already his fame and his, uh, his uh, words are going across the country. People are hearing him. And he, in 1923, he becomes the youngest president of the Congress. And that is where he delivers his, um, a con uh, there are a couple of Congress addresses that I'd like to, um, uh, you know, quote a few lines from. Uh, but there are so many that I'll have to leave out. And so this is 1923 Congress, the youngest Congress president. He's about 33 years old. And it is, um, uh, it is in Delhi. This one is held in Delhi. And the famous lines from here, which are now quoted out of context, in context, which I think the School for Democracy needs to hear this, because they may already imbibe it in their hearts. But here is someone who's saying it in 1923, a man by the name of Maulana Abul Kalam Azad. He's a Maulana. He's an Azad. He's Abul Kalam means, he's a Maulana. Abul Kalam means father of the word. So he is master of the word. He's a Maulana and he's Azad. So he's saying it. And what is he saying? Today, if an angel were to descend from the heaven and declare from the top of the Qutub Minar, that is very, his highest thing, I suppose he was thinking, declare from the top of the Qutub Minar that India will get Swaraj within 24 hours, provided she relinquish Hindu Muslim unity. I will relinquish Swaraj rather than give up Hindu Muslim unity. Delay in the attainment of Swaraj will be a loss to India. But if, our, but if our unity is lost, it'll be a loss for the entire mankind. And this unity, that this unity, he never loses sight of this unity. And it is for this reason that when I quote, quote you uh, something at the end of uh, this uh, session, when he says the partition was a disaster, and he spells it out very clearly. Remember that um, Jinnah called him a showboy of the Indian National Congress. And he considered himself a Qayyad, or a lead. Qayyad simply means leader. Qayyad of, of India, like leader of all Indians. He never considered himself to be a leader of Muslims. It's we who have placed him in that, that niche. And that is why we have, you know, now in all of these um, uh, posters and all that are made during, you know, his birth anniversary and so on, he's presented as a, as a real, uh, as, a, as a caricature. So um, I, I want to now um, speak about his um, Congress address 1940, in which he talks about um, Muslims and a united, again, school for democracy, Muslims and a united uh, nationalism. He says, I am a Muslim, and this is 1940, Ramgarh Congress, there is a uh, there is a conflict between pro changers and and no changers and azad as the you know ultimate arbiter he is asked to reconcile and the famous couplet that he quotes is now very well known okay, when he, the, these two there are two warring factions in congress so that's that's the story of their life so they are uh, he's there and he says uh, while they are fighting he says dilbar ko juda karna ya dil se juda hona so he is thinking what he should do to these warring factions. And ultimately, if there was a great reconciliator, it was Azad. So anyway, in this, um, in this uh, 1940 uh, Ramgarh Congress, he says, I'm a Muslim and profoundly conscious of the fact that I have inherited Islam's glorious traditions of the last 1300 years. I'm not prepared to lose even a small part of that legacy. I have another equally deep realization. 
born out of my life's experience, which is strengthened and not hindered by the spirit of Islam. I'm equally proud of the fact that I'm an Indian, an essential part of that indivisible unity of Indian nationhood, a vital factor in its total makeup, without which this noble edifice will remain incomplete. I can never give up this sincere claim. And, and then he says um, uh, one, one more thing that has to, uh, he says um, about this composite culture and these common uh, heritage, the, which, which we are trying to make into a unique culture and, uh, and a homogenized existence. These common riches are the heritage of our common nationality and we do not want to leave them and go back to the times when this adventure of joint life had not begun. Um, if there are any Hindus among us who desire to bring back the Hindu life of a thousand years and more, they're just dreaming and such dreams cannot become real. Likewise, if there are any Muslims who wish to revive their past civilization and culture, which they brought a thousand years ago from Central Asia, they too dream. And the sooner they wake up from this dream, the better. So, so you know, like he was not much appreciated by the Muslim ulema or, of course, um, I mean, he was on both sides. It was a kind of a double jeopardy for him. So then came 1947 and the bloodbath. And then he, he, he has this um, wonderful little radio speech that he, he, uh, he made, uh, All India Radio, on uh, 2nd of October, Mahatma Gandhi's birthday. And what did he say? He says, in Punjab, five rivers of water have been flowing for thousands of years. Now a sixth river of warm blood has also started flowing. On the rivers of water, we constructed bridges of brick, stone, and steel. The bridge over the sixth river is being constructed with human corpses. 600 years ago, when the Tatars attacked Multan, Amir Khusro lamented, in Multan, along with five rivers of water, five rivers of blood have started flowing. At that time, this ac account may have been an exaggeration, but today it is an irreversible fact. There is so much more to Azad that I can speak about and we can benefit from, but I will simply now talk about his last very important speech, which is when he addressed the Muslims on the steps of the Jama Masjid. It was called Address to Delhi Muslims. It was made on, in, uh, on the 23rd of October, 1947. This again is from my book. And he talks to them uh, about, the Muslims were terrified at that time. They wanted to somehow find a way to get out because there was a huge bloodbath. And he was saying, why are you leaving? What are you leaving for? Do you know what, what kind of a life you're going to? So he, he had spoken and, and the steps of the Jama Masjid. And he said, and he spoke that I had warned you. I had warned you, but I, when I hailed you, you cut off my tongue. When I picked up my pen, you severed my hand. I wanted to move forward. You broke my legs. I tried to turn you over, you injured my back. And when the political, bitter political games of the last seven years were at their peak, I tried to wake you up at every danger signal. You not only ignored my call, but revived all the past traditions of neglect and denial. So only somebody who cares about you can lambaste you. And that is why the Muslims were now listening to him with their bated breath, because he was like a a father who was deeply hurt, deeply injured. And, and then he, were, he had, you know, he was, his whole, his entire being was, in a sense, encapsulated in these words. And then he says, the partition of India was a fundamental mistake. The manner in which the religious differences were incited inevitably, inevitably led to the devastation that you have seen with your own eyes. And then he tells them to stop, stop this exodus. And the same uh, 
you when uh, when the people i live in an area called jamia and people from uh, this area which was has always been a predominantly muslim area were so desperate at that time and they they were all thinking how the hell can we, they, they get out that was the time when dr zakir hussain bare feet ran out of his house and i remember this being told to me by people by my elders who had seen it and said and and said stop it don't go and wrote this wonderful article called qarar ya farar so it, that was like you know have your patience don't run away so in the same way azad also was um, earlier saying you are making a mistake you will always be a stranger in that land and ultimately what did they become they became muhajirs in that land so he said why are you going raise your eyes the minarets of jama masjid want to ask you a question where have you lost the glorious pages from your chronicles was it only yesterday on the banks of the jamuna that your caravans performed their wuzu that means they performed their ablutions today you are afraid of living here remember delhi has been nurtured with your blood create a basic change in yourself today your future as is as misplaced as your jubilation was yesterday so um, you know there is so much more to azad he was a he was a he wrote the best epistolary collection in 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 the urdu language which is a collection of 17 letters that he wrote from his prison when he was in uh, when he was in Ahm ahmednagar prison along with nehru and sayed mahmood and all the leaders rajkumari amritkaur all of them and he wrote these 17 classic letters which were never mailed they were written to his friend habibur rahman sherwani in uh, aligarh but the letters were never mailed and he would probably have just you know destroyed them except his secretary ajmal khan decided that no no the world can't you know this is too much of a treasure so they were all published thank god and it's called ghubar e khatir the soul unburdened in which he reveals his inner self he wrote tazkira which is about his origins but it's also about the sufis who had actually same struggle for speaking the truth whether it was sarmad whether it was mansur halaj people who gave up their lives because they were they were not going to compromise on the truth so this man who today we think of as a muslim leader today we put him in a in a kind of a caricature and uh, uh, image in in our posters this man you know really had the two major principles of his life one was that the quran teaches you hurriyat freedom the quran teaches you sisterhood and brotherhood the quran teaches you that you join with the hindus and get into that heart of the freedom movement you cannot you you cannot build you say sir sayed ahmed khan had told uh, muslims that you know education education abhi to forget about freedom now you should just educate yourself and later on azad used to be a great admirer of sayed ahmed khan but he also wrote at the end of at the end of the day he also wrote ke when the muslims were we were struggling for freedom sayed ahmed khan was holding the dead body of education in his lap so the first thing was the struggle for freedom so different ideas different principles not to undermine but i think at the end of it i want to say that you know to regard azad as a leader of muslims and the muslim bomb is a real disservice to him he he understood he the depths of the quran he used the quran to tell the muslims that this is your quranic injunction this is your duty to struggle for the freedom of your country along with your the hindus of this country you cannot do it alone this culture this composite culture something has been built over deck uh, centuries you cannot you cannot and not uh, start you know building your 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 uh, separate entities and and trying to uh, so call further your cause in factionalism so that's uh, those are some of the ideas and i hope that uh, you know it will give more impetus and reason for you to think for the students of the school for democracy to maybe delve deeper into azar thank you it's been an absolutely wonderful 40 minutes uh, i grew up with uh, 
the most extraordinarily complementary views on Molana. I grew up with the feeling that like Gandhi was a Hindu believer in Hinduism but fought for secularism. Molana was a believer in Islam who fought for secularism and for the for the nation and for its independence. So for me, it's a it's wonderful music to hear your work, to hear the details which I might have missed in my memory and in my reading about Molana Abdul Kalam Azad. But I want to say that for the people who are listening to this talk today from you, it's a revelation. And I cannot for the life of me imagine if one talks about Muslims and Hindus, between the two of us, who is who and what is what? You're my friend, you're my sister. And what does it matter what religion you profess or what religion I do or don't profess? What does it matter? Because humanity is much larger than religion. And it's one lesson that people who fought for the independence clearly established and we've lost it midway. Your commitment and your work, my commitment and my work brought us together and we're bonded in a manner which nothing can sever. It's a bond which is ideological, which is a bond which is born of affection and love. It's a bond which is born of intellectual compatibility. It's a bond which is born out of a desire for truth. And these are bonds that cut across everything else. Molana's life was such an example. He was a wonderful human being. And I grew up with my parents extolling his great virtues, talking about him as a peer, as a political leader, as a national leader. So for me, it's been wonderful. But for listeners who are going to listen to you much more than the School for Democracy is going to be a lecture which is broadcast to much, a much larger audience, I really think that we should not listen to contemporary rhetoric ever. We should learn how to read and listen to people. But what really hurt me today was the mention you made that his documents are no longer available. And for me, it's a huge loss. It's a loss as great as a, as a temple or a mosque being destroyed. When people's intellectual heritage is destroyed, what is left of a country's history is a blank. I'm really, very really sorry to hear that those wonderful words of Molana have been lost in negligence or with deliberation, I do not know, but that they have been lost is a tragedy for the country. When the library in Alexandria was burnt by Julius Caesar and so many volumes were lost, it was a tragedy for the entire world. And repeatedly when books and manuscripts are burnt, it's a loss not for just a few people, it's a loss for mankind. So I'm really disturbed by that and I think we should really start looking at it again, perhaps in another in another arena and another sphere. But I can't thank you enough for pointing out that Malana was part of the national movement in an intrinsic manner and that it's possible to be both religious and secular, which is something we are now losing in our present discussion uh, about the constitution, that you can be part of secular India and be as religious as you feel you must be, that these are not contradictory positions. I have been uh, exhilarated, I've been educated, and it's been a wonderful time listening to you, Saida. Thank you very much from my side, from the side of School for Democracy, and all the listeners will be listening to you talking. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Aruna. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.